Anybody know a little Sam Cooke? <laughs> it's been a long, long time coming, but I know change is going to come, right? Is it right? I can't sing, but I love some Sam Cooke. <laughs> I absolutely cannot sing, but that doesn't stop me. So, you know, when I think about, and, and, and I hadn't seen that particular video, and I think just about uh, change, and there's a, another video that I've seen, because I'm really going to throw us out here with change. Um, there's a, uh, a singer who, he's actually European, if I'm not mistaken. And um, some of you would probably know the song. Now I'm going to draw a blank on the, on the song, um, uh, Going to Church, Take Me to Church. I love that song. Now, just like I, I looked at this video and I got pretty emotional. And it takes me back to you know, the days of my childhood. But when I heard the song, Take Me to Church, and I'm sitting there talking with my daughters, and we were trying to figure out the meaning, and I'm just like, I love it, but I'm not real sure that I should be singing it, because I'm not real sure what they really mean, right? Because sometimes you don't know what songs. So I pulled up the video. And if you haven't seen the video, and if you don't get moved, by the video, but more importantly, it caused me to go out and say, well, why did he write it? And what was the movement that he was trying to affect? Um, and the movement was, in, in the, the UK and the Europe region, they were here recently finding the folks that were gay and lesbian, and they were beating them, right? So it's, it's the hate crimes. So when I think about change, someone to be bold enough to put out a song that talks about take me to church, and a video that is so riveting. And then when you think about the meaning behind it, think about the movement that that one song is creating across the world. Right, so think about that movement. So when I think about this video, you know, why does it, it, why does it strike me so dear to my heart, I think, is because it's been a long time. How many years and how many adjutant generals have we had in Maryland? And how many generals have come before me that were female? actually not a lot on the Army side, not a lot on the Air side. So General Solomon, General Annette Diener, General Carol Briscoe. The fact that I can name them, it's a long time. It's a long time. And the fact that one of the generals who, he was not the longest standing adjutant general in Maryland, but I think he was probably the second, because the longest standing, I think, in, in Maryland was uh, General Record. Uh, but General Frederick actually promoted every single one of us at some point in time in our career. Actually commissioned every single one of us. So that's pretty, that, that to me is pretty daunting, that um, someone of, of his caliber had the vision to do that. And so I think that, you know, while we've come a long ways, we have a long ways to go, right? We have a long ways to go. So if I, I think about myself and those photos, I could have probably been in any one of those photos. No, because you want to know why? Excuse me, I'm a light-skinned African-American female, and I would have been the house lady. Mm -hmm. I would have been the mistress. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't have had to do any chores, because I would have been the mistress, right? right. I'm just going to call it what it is. I wouldn't have been in any of those photos. I would have been born the pretty little babies, 
that, oh, by the way, eventually looked like me. Because when I think where my great-grandmother came from, I'm going to tell you, there was something going on there because she was part German. And by the time, you know, when I met her and, and I grew up with her, she was gray-haired, but she had blue eyes, and she was lighter than me. So when I look at my grandmother, who had green eyes, who didn't know her father, very interesting. Because when I look at, at these photos, I think of, well, why did I never ask? Why did I never ask? What was it like? Because the house that I grew up in is the house that my grandmother was born in. It was the house that was left to her by her mother that I'm sure was given to her somewhere along the line as a gift. I don't know the rest. So when I think of change and I think of the, where I've come from, you know, we grew up in a four-room house. Four rooms, no running water, no indoor plumbing, and my grandmother raised, she actually born 17 kids. Three died very young, so she raised 14 kids, one of which was my dad. And she got me at three months. So she raised number 15 in a four-room house. And you know, I was growing up in the, in the 60s, obviously, in the 70s. But what I, I didn't know is that there was a whole movement going on around me that I didn't quite understand. But what I also didn't know was, you know, well, why didn't I fit in? You know, we were talking about this coming along, you know, along the way. I had, a, I had a great family, but I grew up in a very rural part of Maryland. And when I say rural, I'm talking, I'm from Frederick County. I'm from the county, I'm not from the city. And even during that time, the city was pretty rural. But if you, if you know anything about Maryland, uh, Frederick County, you know, when I would go to school, you could see all the farms with the cows. Be nothing for the cow to get out and come across the road, the bus has got to stop, right? So I grew up in a very rural part. It was 20 minutes for my bus to get us to school. And then for us to actually go grocery shopping, uh, if we didn't just go to the little general store, it was probably about 30 minutes for us to get to a store where we would go grocery shopping. So I grew up in a very, very rural part of the county. And um, I didn't know a whole lot of black folks other than my family. It's just, it is what it is. So when I actually went to school, um, I didn't fit in with the blacks because I was too yellow. I didn't fit in with the whites because I was too black. So I was somewhere in between. But that never stopped me. It never stopped me from having friends that were white or black because I made my way. I made my way. I never turned around and looked at someone who decided that they wanted to call me the N-word, get me down at the end of the day, because I made my way. And actually, if you got in my face, you just might get punched. <laughs> I think I might be one of the only people that how many of you have gotten suspended from school? Come on, show your hands. Oh, there's more in here. Oh, yeah. Yes. Okay. I see some out there. Okay, well, let me give you this one. How many of you get suspended from school on the last day of school for three days the beginning of the next year? <laughs> You did? Oh, your daughter did. Oh, her and I need to meet then. All right? 
Because you want to know what? Some of those folks who bothered me the whole year, I waited until the last day. <laughs> and you want to know what it was? Let me see. I had cartons of eggs. They either got slammed with rotten eggs, and then I really got suspended because I tried to stuff this guy in the locker. Mm. He sort of fit. <laughs> sort of fit, but not quite. I tried to make it fit, right? So I got even. And you know what? I developed the reputation that don't mess with her. But guess what? I was an honor roll student. My teachers never seen that side of me. They were just like, she's so sweet. <laughs> Wait till I walk around the hall. Yes, right? So when I think about it, I, I didn't, and maybe it was because, you know, I forgot to mention that those 14 kids that my grandmother had, 12 of them were boys. Yes. I always wanted to be like the boys. I'd take my shirt off. <laughs> girl, what's wrong with you? Put your shirt back on. But why? They're going without their shirt. You're a girl. Mm. But I want to be like the, your girl. Put your shirt back on. Right? So, you know what I'm talking about, right? So let's think, let's fast forward and say, you know, what drove you so hard? My grandmother was about four foot six inches. She born every single one of those kids on her own at home with the exception of one. She was a force to be reckoned with. She cleaned houses four days a week. She took care of other people's kids because she cleaned their house. She took care of their kids. She brought home the hand-me-downs, which clothed us. And she drove on. The woman never complained. Never, ever complain. And I asked her when you know, I was older, I'm like, you, you never complain. And she says, but what good would it have done? She said, I had a job to do. So when I think about what drove me so hard, it's because if she could do that every single day, take care of someone else's kids and clean their house, then come home and put dinner on the table for at least 10 of us every single day. I never went without food when I lived with her. And I say when I lived with her, because when I lived on my own, you know, I couldn't quite do what she did. It just didn't seem to make sense, you know? So when I think of the strength of women, when I think of the strength of minorities, you know, my grandfather, a wonderful, wonderful man. You didn't cross him, right? I remember I came in one day and um, repeated what one of my uncles said, and I repeated a cuss word. <laughs> so that's when you get a spanking for repeating what somebody else said, and then I said, well, I was just repeating what they said, and then repeated it again, and you still got whacked with the yardstick, right? I got, that's the only time I think he ever beat me was I got whacked with a yardstick, so, and it wasn't really a whacking. It was just kind of like a, you know, I was the baby. So when I think about the strength that they gave me from little, they never, ever disrespected any of their friends. And when I say that, I was somehow, other than going to school and knowing that I was a little different, it didn't strike me that there was prejudice out there. 
but I grew up in a rural part of the state. But it never struck me that people were prejudiced. It just struck me that they were different. They were just different. I never thought about it as such until I got older. Right? I never thought about it as such until I got older. That doesn't mean that I was ignorant to the fact that I didn't know about slavery and all that. As a matter of fact, I read more slavery books. I, I was so intrigued with that time that I wanted to know what it was like. And I also know that I may not have survived just for the sheer fact that I'm a light-skinned black woman. Right? I would have been used and abused, period. So let's think about what does it mean to leave a legacy my grandmother, in her own way, left a legacy. She left a mark on a community that was far and wide. I go back home to Frederick County, to Westminster in Carroll County, to Union Bridge, and I still run into people who knew my grandmother and my grandfather From, I'm talking people from all walks of life. They made an impact in their own way. So the one thing that if, if I took nothing else away from my childhood is that in your own way, you have to make a legacy. You have to leave something. And you don't do that by being meek and mild and never, ever stepping forward for what you believe in. That four-room house was paid for. It was hers. It was nobody else's. It was hers. Right? And whether we thought that it was a kingdom, you would look at it and say, that surely wasn't a kingdom. But in my day, it was a kingdom. Because it's what we called home. So when I think about the strength of People ask me, how did you do it? I think about my grandmother. And I say, if I don't have the fortitude to keep going, then what is she going to think of me? And my grandmother's not living anymore. As a matter of fact, I lost my grandmother um, she died the year that my daughter, my youngest daughter, was born, which is in 1993, so a couple of years after I graduated from OCS. And right after, the year after I got married. And why do I remember it? Because when I was going through OCS, she was battling with cancer. And I almost quit. So, and I'm sure there might be one or two people, maybe one person in here that went to OCS with me. But I almost quit because I wanted to be at the hospital with her. And she said to me, honey, you've got a job to do. You have a path to make. And you need to go on and do it. And as I was crying, leaving her hospital room to go to OCS on a Friday evening, just to be beat up by a bunch of tacks. I'm just like, why? I want to be here with her. That's what gives me the push to continue to go on. When I look at, you know, and, and you know, I know we end it with, you know, President Obama, but I guarantee you that, you know, if you've listened to his story, it's not about whether you like him as president or not. That's not what it's about. It's really about the movement that we're creating for equality for everyone. It's not about, I want African Americans or I want Hispanics, right, to be better than the whites. That's not what it's about. It's about equality for everyone. It's about equal opportunity for everyone. 
if you ever want to know what it feels like walking into a place where you're the only one, try it. Go to a place where you are the only one and try to fit in. That will give you the first indication of, wow, this is different. This is really different. And then you move on and get over it. You move on and get over it. Now there is no doubt that when I meet with the 54, because I've already met with them, <laughs> General Atkins sent me to a meeting, I think it was early part of last year, and I walk in, actually it was in this room as a matter of fact, all the tags are sitting in here and I'm thinking, damn. I'm really young, they're really old. No. <laughs> And then it's like, how am I going to be enough? How am I going to be as good? How are they going to perceive me? Because they're looking at me like, who is she? And then we find the common ground. And once we find the common ground, doesn't matter anymore. It doesn't matter that at that point in time, because General Ashenhurst wasn't in the room, that I was the only female. Didn't matter anymore. Because we were all wearing green for the most part. There was some blue in the room. I'm sorry. I had to be careful of that. All right? So we were all wearing the uniform. And then what mattered at that point was that we all had a common basis. We all had a common basis. And so if I think about, you know, what I tell my team, let's not focus on the differences. Let's focus on how we're all common, how we're all the same, how we all care about some of the same things, and how we want to see some of the same outcomes. Because I think if we start changing our perspective, then not only is change going to come, it's going to come faster. Right? It's going to come faster. And so for me, my foundation starts with a woman who was unbelievably, and, and I, I don't mean to discount my mom, so it's not what I'm saying. But my mom had it easy compared to my grandmother. My mom had it easy compared to my grandmother because of my grandmother doing what she did. When I look at, you know, Martin Luther King. Do you think that he did what he did because he was like, I just want to upset people? No, it was really not about that. It was about, I need to stand for what I believe in. I need to stand for the people that I so love. I need to stand for a purpose, a purpose that's going to invoke change. All right, so I think it's extremely, extremely important that as we live the rest of our lives, that we're going to stand for a purpose. But hopefully we're going to stand for a purpose together. Hopefully we're going to dare, and, and I don't know if, you, if you've seen some of the clips, but I talk about daring to be bold. Daring to do something that no other will do because it's going to invoke the right response. 
you know. I did not have to, and, and I thought about it long and hard, and Sergeant Major and I talked about this. Uh, I'm gonna have to, you know, put some of this on him, but we talked long and hard about whether or not I would put in my packet for TAG. And I debated. And debated. But after I spent numerous accounts with my soldiers, and after I examined a number of the forums that I've been able to participate in and look around the room. I could do one or two things at that point in time. I could stay in my cushiony consulting job, which I was doing pretty well. Actually, I'd just gotten promoted in November. <laughs> just gotten promoted in November and submitted my packet. I'm like, what am I doing? But I chose to get off the porch and do what they say, run with the big dogs, mm -hmm. and throwing myself right in the middle. And it's not, I mean, truly, if you think about it, it's really not about me. And it was, there's a lot of conversations that I had in and around this, and uh, it's caused some heated discussions in, in, in with my family and home, and they're just like, you're crazy. But it's, you know, the one thing that uh, a friend of mine, well, another general, sent me a note And it resonated so much with me because they sent it to me back when I first made general. And, and what they said is that, you know, we're really proud of you, but it's really not about you. So just think about that because it's really not about me. And if I seriously was misconceived that it was, right? The reality of it is it's not about me. I was destined somewhere way along the way to end up here where I am. Whether I wrote the script or not, somebody else wrote it for me. And it is about stepping forward and playing my part in change. And when I say stepping forward and playing my part in change, because change is gonna come. It's a matter of, do I wanna play a part in it and have a positive role? Or do I wanna sit on the sidelines? That's what we have to ask ourselves. That's really what we have to ask ourselves. And it doesn't matter whether I'm a female, whether I'm an African-American female, whether I'm a pink female, whether I'm a blue male. It's about what am I going to stand for once I get here? What am I going to support? What am I going to invoke once I'm here? And so I don't know about you, but when I decided that I was going to throw my name in for the tag. Because it wasn't a given. I'm going to tell you, it was not a given. So if you think sometimes these things are a given, you got something else coming to you because it's very political. It was all about the political piece. Right? And oh, by the way, I did it at the time that, I mean, I didn't know how the elections were going to come out. And I didn't really care, right? I, I really didn't. But I did it at a time where we have a Republican governor in Maryland, which is, it's, it's, you know, not, it doesn't happen all the time. It just doesn't, right? That just happens to be one state where we just don't have them all that often. I, it's just what it is. 
That to me is pretty bold. And my Sergeant Major will tell you is that once I made that decision, I have not looked back. I have not second guessed other than look in the mirror and wake up and pinch myself and say, am I still sleeping? Does this really happen? Is this really going to happen? But I think what was interesting, if we talk about the process, what was interesting is that when I met at that time the governor-elect, he already knew everything he wanted to know about me for the most part because they had done their homework. And what I thought was going to be an interview was him asking me, I want to know more about you. He says, I want to know more about your story. And he says, it's obvious that you have stood for a lot of change. And you want to know what? Him and I found some common ground, like immediately. His daughter served in uniform. His son-in-law is in the reserves. He has a very multicultural family. If you look at his family, his father, longtime politician and served, who now every time he sees me, hugs and kisses me as if he's known me all my life. And we found a common ground. And when I walked out of there, it didn't matter whether I got the job or not. I knew that I made an impression on another individual, another leader, that regardless of whatever decision he made, that would be someone that I could probably call on anytime. You talk about change. When you meet someone and you can impact their perception and the way that they want to go, that's change. That's why we celebrate Black History Month. Because if you look at his cabinet, it's not quite as diverse as it probably needs to be, but he's made some bold moves. But you want to know how it impacted him and how the perception of me impacted him, which I had no idea. When he read my story, when he read my bio, his team said he was moved to tears. And he knew right then and there that we were a match. So if you think about why would I step off and do this, because it felt right. The time is right. The place is right. When the forces of heaven move in and around you, you can make bold shifts in people's lives, in people's thinking, and the position of where we are. So he has now empowered me to be able to make some bold changes. That means that I have to be bold enough to look for the hidden jewels and to pull them out of the depths because they can't seem to find themselves. I have to be bold enough to say, you got some of what I want and you're coming with me. I have to be bold enough to say my force is not diverse enough at the top and I am going to proactively make a decision to pick someone who is different. Why wouldn't I do that? 
why wouldn't I want to bring along others? I am going to be bold enough, and, and I'm going to tell you, it's not just about color and gender. For me, it's about picking the cream of the crop. And I don't care if the cream of the crop comes from Mars. I don't care if they come from Venus, right? What I care about is are they the best at what they do? And what I care about is that if they have the ability to become someone and they don't know that, that it is up to me to tell them. It is up to, for me to find them. And I can't do that sitting in my office. I have to be out and amongst you. I have to get to know who you are. And I have to get to know who you are and who you are. I have to be asking the question every single day, where are my leaders? And who are my hidden jewels? And oh, by the way, you better be reaching deep to find me some diversity in my pipeline. And if it means that my pipeline is not what it needs to be, then I'm asking you to fill my pipeline so that I have the ability to choose diverse candidates because they've gotten the opportunity. They've been given the ability to step forward and lead because someone, by God, someone gave me that opportunity not only once, but twice, but three times, but four times and maybe even more. Someone believed in me when I didn't believe in myself. And there's more than one someone, because I can name them off. There's General Federick. There's General Blum. General Blum said he knew it when I was a lieutenant. He told him to watch out for me. She's going to be something. She's, she's a fire. She's spitting fire, man. Watch out, right? There's General Atkins. There's General Tuxel. There's General Eminez, there's General Hayden, and I can probably go on. Am I naming a lot of generals? Because at one point in time, when I met them, they were not generals. But each of them gave me an opportunity and I didn't waste it. I didn't moan, kick and scream and say, oh, I wish you would have given me that opportunity. You give me the opportunity and I seize the moment. That's what makes me different. Given the opportunity, I'm going to seize the moment. And so when I think about why we celebrate Black History Month, why we celebrate culture and gender, I am not the same as my counterparts. I'm just going to tell you, I'm not. Like I said, I'm better looking. <laughs> That's going on camera, so they're all going to hear that. I get to tell them that too. I'm much better. I'm, I'm younger too. Probably not. I'm not as young as I look. I just have better skincare regimen. That's all. <laughs> better genes. We can say that. But you have to seize the moment. You have to take the opportunity that's given to you. And even if it is the worst opportunity, you ever heard this, it's going to be good for your career? Yes. After I've keeled over, yeah, it's going to be good for my career. Right? You've got to take those moments, and you've got to find out the goodness in them. And then you spin it that it was the best thing you ever did. So if, it's important that we celebrate just being who we are. Just being who we are. Celebrate that. 
and celebrate it every single day. Because regardless of whether you like it or not, unless you want to do some really funky things, you're not going to change who you are. You're just not. So let's celebrate the fact that we are who we are. Let's celebrate the fact that we're different. Let's find the common ground. And let's be the wing, you know, the wind, excuse me, underneath each other's wings. Because I didn't get here alone. I'm not going to be successful alone. I've got to have my team. That means that I've got to have a team of capable folks. And am I going to be looking for the hidden jewels? Always. 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 And I'm going to be pulling them out and giving them opportunity that I then turn around and say, you waste this opportunity, you waste this moment, and I'm going to kick you in the... It's nothing like just giving them a little encouragement. So I don't know if this was what you were hoping to get out of this discussion. I'm hoping that it gives you a little insight to me, but more importantly, why we have to do what we're doing. Why we have to continue to celebrate. Why do we have to continue to push change forward? Because hopefully at some point, our children's children will never ever know what it was like for us. Just like we will never ever know what it was like for those that came before us. Regardless of what we might think, we will never ever know truly what it was like. So let's celebrate each other and celebrate just being, right? Thank you.